Amen. Let's get to this message. All right. We're going to talk about, we're going to read a familiar text, but God's going to give us some new revelation. Somebody say amen. Matthew 25, starting at verse 14. And in this text, if we were looking at the King James Version, it would say, for the kingdom of heaven is like. So I want you to understand that Jesus is is talking to a crowd, but particularly to his disciples, his followers, his disciplined followers. He's trying to explain to them what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so he says this. He says, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. Each according, watch this, to his own ability on his journey immediately somebody said immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents in manner which means he did have immediately the one who had received two talents gained more but he received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came up and he brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents with me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. You notice they're not complaining about who got what. Mm. Look at somebody say, I ain't jealous of you. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent. Somebody said, uh-oh. He came up and said, master. I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. <laughs> he making it about the master, not himself. And I was what? Afraid. And went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reaped where I did not sow and I gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. So unfair, don't you think? Hmm. For to everyone who has, more shall be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out, listen to how he concludes this. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That 30th verse I could have, <laughs> we ain't going to talk about this, but basically he tell them, nah, y'all can't handle that, never mind. <laughs> well, look, who, what is he describing? So he telling them what? Go to hell. But that ain't the title of the sermon. I knew y'all couldn't handle that. That's the title of the sermon in my heart. No, no I'm just kidding. Uh, the title of today's sermon is The Do-Over. The do-over. 
the theme that everything has been filtered through this year is Accelerated Vision. The title for today is The Do-Over. I like that, Tina. Let's talk a minute. As I said to you before we started reading scripture, was that in this chapter, Jesus is trying to illustrate to his disciples what the kingdom of heaven really is. And so he says this to him. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like. Have you ever tried, have you ever had to try to explain something to somebody who never really experienced it before? And so you have to try to come up with something that they can relate to. And even the thing that you come up with, you know it don't quite meet the expectations of what you're trying to describe. But all you can say, well, you know, it's it's like. And so Jesus was trying to introduce them to a concept that they had no bearings, no, 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 no way of fully grasping. But he said, let me just give you something that you kind of sort of might get a glimpse for. And so whenever Jesus is giving a parable and whenever Jesus says something that's like, trust me, what he's trying to give you is so much better than how he's describing it because he's trying to meet you where you are intellectually. So he says to them, here's, here's what it's like. I need you to understand what the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom say kingdom God wants you to know what the kingdom is really like let's deal with that for just a minute the word kingdom put that up for me Tina the word kingdom comes from the Greek word basilia basilia means the right to rule the right to lead the right to teach and so whenever God is talking to you about any kingdom concept he's trying to say this I want you to be my leader I need you to be out front. I need to be able to trust you with teaching, teach you, trust you with ruling, trust you with authority. He says, so when I talk to you in these parables, what I'm doing to you, doing for you, is trying to reveal for you some principles as to how you can reach that place. Does that make sense to you? God is trying to make us his leaders. And so he's saying, listen now, because this is a church that should be attracting leaders. So he says, so if you want to lead, I need you to pay attention to this story. So even in the text, in this text that we just finished reading, the first thing that we are introduced to is the dynamics of the relationship. What we have in the text, we have one man that's a master. Then we have three people and they are what? You got a cast of characters, four characters. One's a master, three a slave. Which means this, you got one person that's used to authority, and you got three that never had it. You got one that's used to being in charge, one that's used to saying things and things happen. You got three that's used to being the responsibility of the one with authority. That's the dynamics of the relationship. It mirrors so much so our relationship with God. That's how we introduce to this text. I want you to understand, I know sometimes, especially when you're dealing with a black crowd, that word slave can throw you off, but that was the dynamics of that time. But even in this text, the word slave could really be defined as either a slave, the spectrum is such. It could be a slave or it could be, goes through servant or it could be student. But nonetheless, the three are under the responsibility of the one who has authority. Does that make sense to you? And so we have this situation where the one who is in authority, something happens. We're not told what happens, but something happens where the master is making an announcement that I got to go away. I got to go away. And really, if we just take a little side road for a minute, this is really Jesus' way of starting to warm the disciples up to the idea that there was going to come a day when he was going to have to leave them. There was a day when he was going to have to ascend into the heavens and leave them with responsibility. But let's look particularly at the text. And so he's expressing to them that I have to leave you. And one of the decisions that he has to make in his departure is how do I distribute my authority? Y'all are familiar with this probably more so than you think. You know, when we're growing up and whomever you stay with, your parents or grandparents, whatever, when they was getting ready to leave, 
they had they pulled everybody together and had the conversation, didn't they? They wanted to talk to you about who what? Who's in charge? And they began to talk about who was responsible for what? Am I right? Who in here is the eldest sibling? And so oftentimes it was the eldest sibling, you you were what? In charge. In charge. And, and and I bet I didn't even live with y'all, but I bet some of y'all didn't know how to handle authority. Some of y'all, if y'all are real honest, some of y'all got brothers and sisters who still mad at you. Because you was a little tyrant when mom and daddy left you in charge. You saying, yeah, that's a shell was like that? Still is, isn't she? All right. So when Miss Mabel left Shell in charge, don't look at me like that, Shell. Let me quit listening to you. I'm hurting my love offering. Um, when you've never been familiar with a thing, sometimes you take it too far. But nonetheless, if we leave and we have to do this. And so the master was saying, I've got to, I got to distribute this authority. I got to do just like your mom and daddy did. They didn't give you permanent authority. They gave you temporary authority. Your authority ended when you heard the car pulling up in the driveway. And your siblings let you know, mama them home, leave me alone. They let you know, let you know you had no more control because the real authority had just gotten back home and more, nine times out of ten they had a nice report to give to them concerning your abuse of power. But nonetheless, here is where the master is. Here's the dilemma that he's facing. And as I said to you, what God is trying to do in this parable is trying to convince you, show you, teach you how to be his leader. How to accept the authority he's trying to give you. And that begins to beg this question that I want to ask you all today is this. Will you be ready? Or better yet, let's talk in terms of degrees. How ready will you be when the season of blessings show up? How ready will you be when the long-awaited opportunity shows up? How well will you be when God finally opens the door that you've been asking for. Because they didn't, get, they didn't get a whole lot of warning with this. It just popped up one day and he had a conversation with him. Listen, the opportunities of God, he knows you don't know. How ready are you? How ready are you when this happens? Let me show you a little something about this because I need you to understand how God does this so you can begin to challenge some stuff about you. Put up for me, Tina, uh, 25 and 15. So this is what he did. He's trying to figure out how he's going to divvy up this authority. And the scripture says this. He gave one five talents to another. He gave two and to another. He gave one. We all know that. But the part I want you to zero in on is how he made the decision. He made the decision like this. According to what? He made the decision according to their own ability. That begins, if you get this, when you get this, it'll begin to eliminate your need to compare yourself to somebody else according to their own ability. What is that even about? He's been a good father. Let me tell you what it means by your abilities. I think I gave you that definition, Tina. Put that up. There it is. Look at this. Your abilities reveal how developed you are at the time of opportunity. But also goes a little further. It also reveals how receptive you've been to development. Mm. Let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go back up. It's, 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 it's speaking in present and in past tense all at the same time. Your present ability, what you can handle today, is a reflection or a revelation of the development that you've allowed yourself to have. How receptive have you been up to this point? How receptive have you been to correction? How receptive have you been to instructions up to this point? 
point because the opportunity, guess what, is coming. And see, you just don't know when it's coming, but you do know of the training that's being offered. So you need to understand some stuff about God. God, the Bible says God already knows you, right? Which means he's already gone through your entire life. Here is something that you need to understand. God has planted goodness for you throughout your life, and it's time bound. There's some stuff he planted in 1989. There's some stuff he planted in 1997. There's some stuff he planted in 2013. And the degree of your regret today shows us how much you developed when it showed up. The only reason why you got regret is that when the moment came, you realized you weren't prepared. Not only were you not prepared, you also have to live with the fact that I had every opportunity to get ready. So God says, I got to bless you. I want to do this, but I only can give you this. Because I got to do it according to how attentive you've been to your development. I got to do this according to how receptive you've been. How receptive are you? Can't nobody tell you nothing. Then can't nobody give you nothing. Hmm. Mm. Are you taking full advantage of the countless opportunities to prepare yourself? Mm. And this Episcopal church fell silent. What are you doing with it? See, what amazes me about us is that we want so much, but we do so little to get ready. We've convinced ourselves God is an indiscriminate blesser, that he'll give you stuff that you're not even ready for. And here's what I know about you. You're a better parent than that. You know your children well enough to know what they can't handle. Am I right about it? How much better is God at parenting? The thing is, you say you want, you, you, well, let's, 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 let's go ahead and offend some folks. You want so much, but I don't, I don't see you at Bible study. But you want something in the church. Breathe, people, breathe. But you ain't got time to come get impartation. You want so much and you want God to use you. You quick to tell everybody about the prophecy over your life. But the prophecy is talking about the end result. But they talk about all the stuff you got to do to get to the end result. You called to do this international ministry and this, that, and the other. But you can't come and get any training. You want so much. But where's your development? You ain't got time to come to Sunday school because you peeped in and you didn't see your favorite teacher. So you decide to go worship at Starbucks until service starts. But you want so much. Where is your development? How receptive have you been to correction? How receptive have you been to the messaging of God? Because you're somewhere deciding you don't need something. And what's amazing, watch this now, it ain't that hard to distinguish the folks who show up to get. You, don't, you not only see them excel and move up in the church, but what's so amazing about the principles and understanding of God, you see that same movement and mobility in the secular world. They got folks outside in their job saying, where did you get this information from? And their answer is... But you still think this is your grandma's church. Mm. Oh, it's good. <laughs> God is limiting himself according to your development. When is my season coming? When is God going to have a platform for me? They holding me back. God, no, God said, that's me. Why won't they consider me? God, because I blind them from you. Because I don't just love you, I love them. 
and I can't put you in authority and destroy what they've been building. Mm, amen, Pastor Jones. You in the house today. Are you ready? And if it shows up, can you handle it? Look at your neighbor and say, can you handle it? If, if he, if, if he look, 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 look back at him and say, say for real, for real. If he, if, he, if he shows up and gives you what you've been asking for, talk, talk, I don't hear y'all talk to him. Say, if he gives you, it's uncomfortable because you look at him and you know they ain't ready. You know they ain't ready. If he shows up, you trying to find somebody you can ask the question to. You try, I know. Can you handle it? You waiting for the breakthrough? What if it happens at 3.30 this afternoon? Are you ready? Can you handle it? The pastor, will, will explain to me, Pastor, what it means to handle, because I think I can handle Okay, here it is. Let me explain it to you. Ah. To handle means in your hands it becomes better. As a matter of fact, according to scripture, it don't just come become better, it doubles. Will it double up because it's with you? Or will it be somewhere buried? Can you have, have you prepared yourself <laughs> to handle it? That's honest. How many opportunities have you foregone to get ready? And you're somewhere begrudging leadership and even God, but you ain't ready. You got the vision. You know what you're supposed to do. You hear God, all of that. But are you ready? I feel like I need to use broken knees. It is you. Is you ready? See, watch this. Let's keep going. Stay with me. Don't, don't, don't go nowhere. I'm going to help us. This authority, he was trying to figure out how to give authority. So first hurdle he has to go over is to determine where you are in your abilities. And what I'm so excited about before we move on is that even if you haven't developed where you should be, he still gives. He doesn't, he doesn't withhold. He just gives according to. So some of y'all ought to still tell God, thank you. Because you're still giving what I can handle. I don't leave here empty-handed, but there's a part of me that realized I didn't leave with as much as I should have. And so after he gets past this whole idea of judging your ability, the next step that he does is in, in distributing this authority, the authority was given to them in the form of money. In the form of money. And I can understand why God used that as part of the parable because I'm sure everybody in here can relate money to authority. Am I right? We've come to understand that in the world we live, the economic system and the political system is based on money. As much as we hate it, the one who has the gold makes the rules. That is the golden rule of today's terms. It ain't do unto others as you have them to do unto you. It's he who has the gold makes the rules. And the only way that the people without the gold can assist in the rules is that we come together and be unified. So they work overnight to make sure we're divided. And as long as we stay divided, the ones who have the money can still make the rules. And we're down here fighting each other while they're making the rules. Mm. Somebody say, man. Mm. And so he is deciding to give them money. So what did he get? What does he give the first one? Five what? Second one. The last one. I bet some of y'all don't realize, because we're going we're gonna to change how you even look at this text. He wasn't stingy. He gave them a lot of money. Watch this. He gave them talents. Watch this, y'all. One talent. One talent equals 6,000 denarii. 
Somebody say, teach them with the jaws. <laughs> 6,000 denarii. A denarii is a Roman coin. Here's what I need you to understand about a denarii. One denarii was equivalent to one day's wages. One denarii is equivalent to one day. You can feed your folk off of a denarii. So if you understand this, one talent equals how many days wages? Six thousand. How many did he give the first one? He gave him five talents, which equals 30,000 denarii. Or to really blow your mind, he gave him 82 years of wages. At one time. How many of y'all would be all right if your job gave you? <laughs> you get to work on Monday night, check it. They say, oh, all right, all right, Ron Chica, we're going to pay you 82 years. See, and y'all wonder why God don't move like that no more because he know we out of here. God, we... <laughs> you ain't going to never say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The next one gave, he gave how many? Didn't seem like a lot at first, did it? But that equals 12,000 denarii or 33 years of wages. That ain't bad right there. And the one y'all felt sorry for. Gave him one talent, 6,000 6, denarii, which equals 16 years of wages. That's impressive, isn't it? Now, watch this, though. That's, 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 that's pretty doggone life changing. Don't you think? Any, any, any of y'all be all right with any one of these? Any one of these, right? You're like, you be like, Lord, Lord, I ain't greedy. You ain't got to. <laughs> That's when you're trying to fake humility, trying to act like you're humble. But Jesus, you ain't even got to give me five. You know, just, just give me four and a quarter. <laughs> but, but, it, but it looks, it, it is. It's, 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 it's life changing. And, and the master. Knew it would be life changing, but watch this. He knew it would be life changing before we did the calculation. Because you missed something at the beginning. Put verse 14 up there for me. You missed something at the beginning. It says, For, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called the slaves and he entrusted his possessions to them. I've read this so many times, and I'm telling you, you need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit because he'll show you how deep word really is. And for the first time, I tripped over the word possessions. Because I just read it like it was. You know, if he's giving me, he's giving me his stuff, he's giving me possessions, he's giving me his money, that makes sense, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit said, You don't understand what's written there. Because stuff gets lost in translation when we're trying to take an ancient language and convert it into English. Put up there what possessions really means. That blew my mind. The word possessions really means, I know, go look it up yourself. It means to make a beginning. The master is saying, I'm giving you enough to make a beginning. I'm giving you enough to facilitate your own do over. Mm. When I left here, when, as I leave here, you're a slave. But I'm going to give you enough. Go away. It's enough for a new beginning. 
It's enough for you to walk away from your past. It's enough for you to do these things you thought you had missed. It's enough for you to pick back up all the stuff you thought you missed out on. I'm leaving it in your hands. And see what you do with it. Look at somebody and say, you got enough. Then look back at him and say, what you doing with it? It's giving you enough <laughs> for a do-over. But it's based on to how developed you are. And it's based on how receptive you've been. You've always had enough. But the only thing that kept you from your do-over was how receptive you are. God has always positioned you to learn how to do a new thing. Has he not? But you're always distracted when the teaching is going forward. You're always somewhere acting like you already got it figured out because you rather have image than substance. You're always somewhere acting like you don't need it. And God says, I can't even activate what I've given you because you're not even receptive to the question. The question I have for you, what has God sent into your life to initiate your do-over? Who has God sent into your life to initiate your do-over? What has God given you so that he can restore the years that the canker worm has stolen? See, what you have here, watch this, listen to me. What God is saying in scripture and saying to us today, if you are receptive, God is saying, this thing that I'm getting ready to do for you is so good, it will feel like you get to recover the last 82 years, the last 33 years, the last, see, I don't know about you, I'm okay with just 16. God, if you can just give me See, you ain't even, see, see, I'm 48. I could use 33, but if you don't give me 30, if you just give me 16 back, the stuff I could do, as a matter of fact, God, if you give me 36 hours, <laughs> God is saying, what I'm trying to show you in this season of accelerated vision, listen, it'll be just like you got it all back. Redeem the time. Buy back the time. If you are receptive. Will you handle it right? Or will you bury it? What have you been doing? Hmm. The Bible says that when they got the talents. The first one, first one moved how? Talk to me. Moved how? We believe that the word of God has the answers to all of life's questions. That's why we study it daily and we apply it. We apply it immediately. Why are you still dragging your feet? God, I need you to move how? Because if you don't move quick, you start negotiating. If you don't move quick, you start remembering. You start elevating the past above the present. You start remembering what other people said versus what God says. You start comparing what, the, what your parents said to what God is saying. And all of a sudden they went out because I see them. I only hear him. If you don't move swiftly, then you, if you don't move quickly, you start attacking your help. Am I right about that? Because you'll stop viewing it as help and you'll graduate calling it a challenge, then you'll call it attack. How many times have you called your helper your attacker? 
and called your attacker friend. Mm. You got to move this thing quickly. And here's what amazes me. Get this now. Hmm. These two, the first two were, when the story began, the first two were what? What, were they, what, did, what did the Bible call them? Slaves. Slaves. But in order for them to move quickly, you know what that must say about them? That somewhere down on the inside, they had a belief that I ain't going to end up like this. Somewhere down on the inside was this gnawing voice that kept saying, man, I'm better. I'm better than this. Something kept, something kept them on their edge, waiting just for the opportunity to prove the voice on the inside to be true. Because can you imagine how tough it is to live under the conditions of, the sl of a slave but know on the inside I'm better? Oh, you already know what that's like. You right now are living in such a confined situation, such a bound and limited situation, while something on the inside said, you know we're bigger than this. But it ain't activated because my receptivity has been low. Life has told me to fight help. <laughs> I don't receive it. And so God can only bless me according to how open I am to it. Is that anybody's story? But the first two did what? They moved immediately. But then here come the last one. I hear y'all sigh. Because truth be told, if we're honest, which one we relate most to? Opportunity came. Others moved swiftly. They, the Bible says they took theirs and they, they went out and they um, trade. They did trade. Trade really means they went to go do business. Business means to create recognizable value. They went and created value because they didn't lose their value. Their value wasn't squashed because of their condition. I could, be, I could be living in squalor while I still feel like a king. I'm not going to match what I think about myself to what you see on me. Mm. And so when they had the opportunity to move out and create value, they could only create value if they always knew they were valuable. Who knows you're valuable? But then this last one. His opportunity to show up and what he started doing. That opportunity comes and he digs a hole. How many of you live like that? I'm digging a hole for myself. I got an opportunity to be better, but I'm digging a hole. For me. Because if I keep digging, the hole goes from looking like a hole to start looking like a grave. Because if I ain't going to live, I might as well go ahead and. Why did he not move? 25 25. I was afraid. I'm scared. I got all of this, but I'm scared. I'm scared of what people are going to think. I'm scared of what my family going to say. They already say I think I'm better than everybody. Yeah. I'm scared I ain't going to be invited to stuff no more. Yeah. I'm scared to show people who I really am. I'm scared to put my gifts on display. I'm scared of responsibility because it shines the light on it. Here's the one I hate the most. I'm scared because it's got to be too good to be true. It's too good to be true. And so you prophesy failure over your life. Digging a hole. 
They told me, if you find yourself digging a hole, stop digging. Some of us can't embrace the do-over because you're so scared to live that you're unconsciously digging your grave. I'm going to die right here. With all this potential, with all this glory that God has for me, with all this stuff I'm supposed to do, all these books I'm supposed to write, these plays I'm supposed to write, these businesses I'm supposed to build, these ministries I'm supposed to start, these lives I'm supposed to touch, but I'm scared. If you go back, I should have gave you this thing, but I didn't open the book of Revelations. When God talks about those who will not inherit the kingdom, the first one he says is murderers. The second one he says is the fearful. Then he says other cruel stuff like pedophiles and what have you. He put the fearful in the category of murderers. I said, how can you put the fearful with the murderer? He said, because you keep killing you. And I keep having to resurrect you and you keep killing you right over again. I keep sending goodness your way. I keep sending inspiration your way. The moment I get a little momentum with you, you hear some contrary word and you go ahead and commit suicide all over again. And then I got to be the resurrection for you again. Get you to some service and you start feeling alive again. But soon as the pressure of life hits you, you go ahead right on back. <coughs> soon as somebody conflicts you. Uh, Soon as somebody challenges your progress, soon as your friends don't want to be your friends no more because you're doing better than them. Soon as they don't want you to be where you grow. You go right back to diet. Soon as your help holds a mirror in front of you. You'd rather die and look at you. You'd rather die than deal with you. You'd rather die than be corrected. You'd rather live with the pain of never getting to you than the pain of correcting you. Only one of those bears fruit. You have been given the opportunity of a do-over. My promise to you is that we've been meeting, we met almost all day yesterday, preparing for your 2020. We are determined to give you everything. We're setting the table before you to give you everything to discover, develop, maintain your vision. Because I know one thing we all got in common. Everybody wants life. Life ain't given to you until you know why you're here. But if we set the table and you don't come eat, or you peeping in the door to see who cooking, because ain't, ain't, pastor ain't the only one cooking in here. And we got wisdom scattered throughout the building. If you can't submit, you can't build. Am I making sense? Put the takeaway up there. I'm going to stop right there. I got a chance for a do-over. The takeaway ain't nothing but questions. Will you be ready for God's open door because you humbled yourself and allowed yourself to be developed? Will you be receptive to correction so that you can be freed from bad information and grow? Will you move immediately when the opportunity arrives? And will you handle it or them right? Please understand something. I am not in any way trying to rain on your dream. But if you don't take what's what's strange about some of us is that we don't value instructions until we are the instructor. 
you fight and fuss about every piece of order or anything laid down. But here's what's going to happen to you. I'm going to warn you because you, you're going to have the unction to step out and try it. And the moment you step out and try it, you then begin to value unction, value order. But if you've never been an orderly person, all you will give off is rebellion. You won't suddenly, you won't suddenly be able to value structure when you have false structure all your life. And so you will draw unto yourself rebellious people. Learn how to submit now. If you haven't built anything, quit acting like you know how. Learn how. And get to it much quicker. Eliminate. The, the, the beauty or the blessing of submission is that I get to eliminate some errors in my life by watching somebody else go through it. And so that when it's my time, I get there quicker. You're not wasting time by serving. You're saving yourself heartache for later when God says go. Am I making sense to you? Come on, let's stand. Is anybody ready for a do-over? Anybody ready? God is showing you how to redeem the time instead of repeat the times. Let me say that again. God is trying to show you how to redeem the time instead of repeat the time. I don't want to do what they did before me. I don't want to do what I did before. I don't want to stay in the cycle. God, you said glory to glory, faith to faith, precept upon precept. Every round, as grandma used to say, every round, I'm tired of exhausting myself on the same round. If I'm going to be tired, let me be tired because I went up. Am I right about it? Bow your heads for I genuinely pray that you receive the word today. It is not one that confines you or bounds you. It is one that puts you in the, in the vein of acceleration. It will quicken your ascension. Stop fighting the process you can't change. Father, we thank you so much for how you're stretching us into our proper form. You're making us leaders, having tough conversations with us, but they bear fruit. They shape in character. Iron, sharpening iron, causing occasional sparks and heat, but the results of it is a sharpness we've never had before. Thank you for that. Before we leave this building, is there anybody else that remains or somebody that may have come in late who did not hear the call unto salvation? The highlight of whatever we do is that somebody says yes to Jesus. Here at CYM, you don't have to come down front. Try not to make a spectacle of you. Try not to give you any reason to be ashamed. We just want you to get free. So everybody around you has their eyes closed. Nobody's staring at you. Because they're too busy trying to get themselves together too. If you're in this place and you know it's time to connect with God through Jesus Christ. 
All you have to do is put your hand in the air for me for about, for about two or three seconds and you can take it right back down. Just give me time to acknowledge you. So where is that person who's ready? Let me see your hand. Is there another? Praise God for the two. But I sense. We thank, you. we thank you for the ones that went up earlier, but God, I sense. I do, I do, I do. I sense. I sense. Pray, saints. I sense. One more. God likes to do things in threes. I sense one more. Don't negotiate. Don't. There it is, right there. There it is. There it is. And, 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 listen, it, 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 it's, it's not slipping past me the fact that it's a third man. It's a man. I'm just, I'm just excited because even as I was sitting there earlier, those two hands that went up after the worship and they said it was two men, I said, God, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. And even while that was happening, Jamal, I was trying to send something over to you. I said, look what God is doing. He's grabbing men. He's grabbing men. He's grabbing and 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 brother, we've been praying for you. We we we, we, was, we didn't even know your name. We was talking about you yesterday. We want God to not make the, make the church just to be 80, 20 women and 20% men. We believe men need to be saved because they need to be the foundations of our community, of our household. They have to be leaders. And God, we celebrate that you're moving so quickly. You want us to move immediately because you move immediately. We just petitioned heaven on yesterday, and God, you already gave us a down payment, a down payment, hallelujah, of the things to come. You are proven we are on the right track. Thank you, Master. Thank you. So come on, y'all. Let's, let's pray with this brother. And I need you to pray like it's somebody you love. I need you to pray with volume like that's your child, your husband, your nephew. Repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And because of my faith, and because of my confession, the word says, and I believe the word, the word says that I am saved in this moment, right now, immediately, I'm saved. Holy Spirit, I'm saved now. You can live in me. You can teach me. You can correct me. I'm receptive. I'm receptive. Develop me in your image. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Now, Father, we thank you so much for proving yourself mighty all over again. For being greater than our flaws, greater than our errors, greater than our history, you're still God no matter how we show up. Thank you for not wavering on who you are and your greatness. We honor you, we worship you, we love you. We're so glad to be connected with you. Now, Holy Spirit, take these three men and make them into your men. Blow their minds with the things you have prepared for them. Eyes have not seen ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what you have prepared for these three who said yes to you today and make us the church that can support their growth. Thank you for allowing us just to be live right now. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name.
I love y'all. Amen.